regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards, and I am glad you've joined us on the program today. Steve Gutowski of The Reload going to be with us in just a moment. We are talking about the uh, confirmation or the nomination of David Chibben as a permanent director of the ATF. A uh, nomination that is uh, decidedly in trouble. Even uh, gun control uh, activists like those working for The Trace have had to acknowledge that uh, Chipman's nomination on the ropes at the moment uh, cannot get the uh, uh, approval of uh, senators like Angus King of Maine, an independent who caucuses with Democrats, John Tester of Montana, still publicly undecided, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, still publicly undecided. Meanwhile, the Senate getting ready to recess for a month, uh, and that could just absolutely you know, put a screeching halt to whatever momentum there might be uh, for Chipman's nomination overall. Uh, in fact, this uh, uh, study or this uh, story by USA Today in the Trace uh, reported that advocates for David Chipman are actually calling for a Senate vote before the Senate recesses this weekend, uh, which kind of tells me that uh, maybe the administration is uh, running out of patience with the uh, Chipman nomination. New York Times actually reported a couple of months ago, by the way, that uh, Biden was initially reluctant to nominate David Chipman to this position, but was convinced to do so after the uh, shootings in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Boulder, Colorado. Gun control activists apparently said, look, now's the time. Uh, we can get this gun control activist in charge of the ATF. It's the golden opportunity. Uh, let's take advantage of this. Biden, Biden bit. Uh, and it hasn't worked out the way that uh, the administration or gun control activists were hoping, in large part, because of David Chipman himself. So let's talk about this with Stephen Gutowski, the uh, founder of the Reload.com. He's been doing some excellent reporting on this issue, uh, ticking off all of the right people, although I know that's not his intent. His intent is not to uh, make gun control activists angry or even to derail the nomination of David Chipman. His intent is to actually report on what's going on with this nomination in a way that, frankly, most media outlets have no interest in doing because they're they're in the tank for this nominee. Take a look and a listen. Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's good talking with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. This is such a, a, a fast-moving story now because it really seems like we're starting to enter the end game uh, of the Chipman nomination. Uh, USA Today and their, their partner, The Trace, uh, 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 reporting uh, today that advocates uh, for David Chipman are calling for a full vote in the Senate this week before the Senate recesses, which kind of tells me that, you know, obviously USA Today and the Trace didn't report this, but uh, I'm wondering if there's not been some sort of uh, edict from the White House of, all right, look, either we get this done uh, soon or forget it. We, we go to plan B, whatever plan B might be, because we can't keep dragging this out. It's been more than a month now since... Uh, uh, the Senate Judiciary deadlocked on Chipman's confirmation. You know, we've seen, at least publicly anyway, uh, uh, little to no movement in support of Chipman from the likes of John Tester, Joe Manchin, Angus King of Maine. Uh, and now it's basically time to fish or cut bait, it sounds like, uh, as far as the administration is concerned. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in D.C., the longer you wait on something, the less likely it is to happen. So uh, certainly I think... Given how long they've waited on Chipman already, and the, these sort of continuous flow of negative stories that have come out about him in the last few weeks here, uh, it is hard to see how he's going to get confirmed without some sort of you know external uh, you know motivating event happening. Absolutely, um, and you know again, I mean from from what we know at least publicly. Uh, all three of those uh, red state Democrats or Angus King's an independent, but he caucuses with the Democrats. Um, you know, all three of them are, are, are still not on board uh, with the Chipman nomination, although I, I will confess I, I I'm, I'm a little um, less optimistic about Joe Manchin. Uh, clearly, Manchin is trying to do what he can to help the nomination. He's uh, introduced David Chipman to Jim Justice, West Virginia's governor, apparently held a, a Zoom uh, tell a town hall with David Chipman, uh, which I, I certainly didn't hear about that. I don't know how widely publicized this was. Uh, and what I find really interesting is that I don't think I don't think that this is publicly available. Uh, at least I haven't seen where folks can actually watch this tell a town hall between West Virginians and David Chipman. Have you? No. Yeah, I thought the same thing when I saw that reported. Uh, but I'd like to see that uh the town hall and who was in it and what questions were asked and what Chipman said. Cause I mean, Chipman hasn't 
done any sort of interviews since since his confirmation hearing, which is not necessarily abnormal. Uh, obviously, I think most nominees they don't want you to go out and do a bunch of interviews, but. I mean, Chipman hasn't even issued a statement. He hasn't even issued a denial on uh, these claims that he made racist remarks. So it's interesting to see that he did a, a whole town hall with uh, Senator Manchin and, and that it was apparently uh, private or at least not publicized. Yeah, I mean, certainly, it, it, like I said, I mean, I, you know, you and I kind of look for these things. So it, I guess it's uh, it's not inconceivable that maybe this was publicized locally and we just didn't see any mention of it beforehand but uh but yeah I, i'm curious to know the details of that town hall as well um you know i, I gotta ask i mean the senate judiciary committee uh, met today uh i know that uh several senators have referenced your reporting there at the reload uh I, obviously gun control activists and chipping supporters are uh they're 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 hot and bothered by your reporting Stephen. uh they're angry that you are you know talking to atf agents both current and former agents uh, who are expressing their reservations, not only about the alleged comments that Chipman made regarding black ATF agents when he was at the Detroit field office. But, I mean, they're concerned about what Chipman's confirmation would mean for the agency itself at this point, not only given his, uh, you know, 10 years almost as a, a paid gun control activist, but but what this uh, bitter nomination fight and what the uh, inevitable politicization of this agency would, would mean for those agents who are tasked every day with, you know, ensuring that uh, uh, violent criminals can't get a hold of guns, that they face consequences when they do. They say that this would be a step in the wrong direction. Yeah, certainly these agents that I spoke with have concerns that go beyond just the racist uh, allegation against Chipman. Uh, you know, they're, they're concerned that his history of at really an adversarial approach towards the industry could have a detrimental effect on uh, field agents' ability to make cases uh, that rely on cooperation from gun dealers, um, you know, which is a significant number of cases from what these agents have told me. It's a significant part of how they do their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we also had the seven uh, retired agents who went on record to say effectively the same thing. So, you know, th these concerns are shared across uh, you know, a number of different agents from a number of different uh, avenues. Absolutely. And, you know, listen, I mean, I, I'll be blunt here. The White House doesn't have a good response to this. Uh, Jen Psaki's response is, oh, it's, it's, it's Republicans. Republicans just, you know, if they don't care about gun violence. Look, it's yeah, all 50 Republicans are opposed to David Chipman, which, by the way, should tell you something when, you know, moderates like Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski uh, say that Chipman is inappropriate. But ultimately, it's it's Democrats who are holding up this nomination uh, and for very good reason. Um, as you just outlined, you've got these current and former agents who are expressing grave concerns. But the White House doesn't want to talk about those concerns. Right. I mean, they, they're they sticking to that narrative of David Chipman spent 25 years of the ATF. He's an outstanding individual. He'll bring uh, real leadership to the uh, agency, ignoring those complaints by the the agents themselves uh, about how Chipman's confirmation would negatively impact the agency's ability to do their job. You know, and, and I got to say, too, I mean, when when I was watching that interview that Chipman did on uh, Chinese state run media uh, right after the Sandy Hook murders in December of 2012, this was something else that uh, was uh, brought up uh, uh, during the Senate Judiciary Committee today. I got to tell you, Stephen, I was really struck by the repeated comments by Chipman during this five minute long interview. I mean, on multiple occasions, he talked about how how we can give meaning to these deaths of school children by passing gun control laws. I didn't get specific because at the time he gave that interview, he was working for mayors against illegal guns and Michael Bloomberg hadn't made any public comments. So he didn't want to step on his boss's toes. So he didn't talk about any specific policy recommendations, but he made it very clear that uh, that, that we could, again, imbue these murders with some sort of meaning, give these young lives some sort of uh, a meaning that they didn't have as long as we impose new restrictions on, on gun owners. And then later in that interview, he talked about how uh, both in his time at the ATF and then during his uh, then current time at Mayors Against Illegal Guns, he viewed that as in essence the same mission, right, to prevent uh, more deaths like this from taking place, which is a, a laudable goal. Don't get me wrong. 
But Chipman told the Senate Judiciary Committee during his his confirmation hearing that he'd be able to separate his activism uh, from his role as ATF director if he's confirmed. And what what that interview told me is that Chipman sees this as as part and parcel of the same thing. This, these, these roles are are complementary to each other uh, because whether it's working as ATF director or working as a gun control activist, uh, Chipman you know, believes that the answer to reduce these types of violent crimes is to impose new restrictions. And as ATF director, it seems to me like not only would he believe himself to have a professional obligation to do so, but a moral obligation to be a gun control activist as ATF director. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, clearly his, his intention in those comments in that interview. Um, certainly, uh He's made the opposite assertion now uh, while, while he's up uh, for this nomination. But, uh, you know, I, I think something you said there was, was particularly interesting, too, because what I've noticed as well is that there hasn't really been any substantive response from the White House or uh, Dick Durbin or, or the gun control groups that support Shipman's nomination to any of the stories that have come out, uh, whether it's the allegations of racism or or, or anything else, uh, or what, you know, some of these agents have, have said about his fitness for office. Mm-hmm. You haven't, and I found that kind of odd. It's almost like they weren't prepared for any sort of pushback on Chipman, even though, uh, Jen Psaki said that they expected it to be difficult to confirm him. Um, you know, they haven't had any ATF agents come out, uh, in the last two weeks to defend him. Um, uh, there must be some that support him, right? I think, I believe there's been one or two that were on record supporting him. Um, I mean, a lot of these agents said he's not a bad guy necessarily. They just don't, uh, think he'd be good to run the, the agency. Um, it's just kind of odd to see they haven't, he hasn't even issued a denial to the claim that he made racist remarks and that this complaint that's filed against him relates to that. So it's kind of been, an odd fuddle, you know, befuddling response from the, from the White House. Uh, yeah, it has been. And I, I'm not sure if that's by design or if that's just ineptitude. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, is this their strategy? Well, let's just, you know, uh, uh, keep Chipman away from the public eye. Let's just accuse every uh, one of these uh, uh, damaging stories as, as, you know, just call it a smear. Uh, but you're right. There has not been a substantive response. In fact, I, I jokingly said on Twitter that it's ironic to see gun control advocates shoot the messenger because that's what they've done with your reporting. Uh, they haven't tried to actually f- f- counter it with facts. They've just said, well, Gutowski's a gun extremist. Uh, he writes for that gun extremist website that's funded by the gun lobby, which, by the way, as you point out, uh, you are user funded, right? You don't you, you haven't gotten any big checks from the uh, from the gun lobby, quote unquote. No, uh, I'm filming the, filming this from my one bedroom apartment. I, I do not have uh, uh, the private flights and fancy suits that uh, <laughs> that would come along with uh, being bought off by uh, you know the, uh, some sort of shadow lobby here. And the reload is literally 100% reader funded. It's funded through subscriptions that people buy uh, because they value the reporting uh, and want exclusive access. Which, uh, by the way, any of your your listeners may do the same uh, if they would like over at thereload.com can uh, buy a membership to support my reporting uh, and to keep stories like this that otherwise, I mean, probably would never have seen the light of day, frankly, because uh, I don't I don't know of anyone else uh, um, in major, major media who's been looking into any of these claims. No, in fact, most of the major media outlets, I, I have been gratified to see um, Politico noted your reporting. Noted, didn't really in exhaustively cover, but at least noted it. Some media outlets are starting to at least, re- or you know, uh, acknowledge your reporting, but a lot of them aren't. I mean, the the Washington Post, for example, had a big editorial, uh, unsigned. So this is the you know the opinion of the editorial board uh, in talking about you know why Chipman should be confirmed. And again, they don't touch on any of your recent reporting uh, in their op ed. Um, the I, I've also noticed, Stephen, and, and I think you probably noticed this too, like Dick Durbin has done this, uh, and this was a, a major part of the uh, USA Today, uh, the Trace story today, letting Dick Durbin talk about, you know, like photoshops of, of David Shipman uh, at Waco, which, and, and, and sort of putting it out there as if this is some sort of organized effort, right? Now, those, those photoshops of uh, David Shipman, I mean, they're out there. 
But I haven't seen any Republican senators push them. I certainly haven't seen you push them. We haven't pushed them at bearing arms. Uh, We've actually been trying to separate the fact from the fiction. Uh, and, And the bottom line is there are enough troubling facts about David Chipman's time at ATF and uh, his uh, you know, previous uh, tenure at both Mayors Against Illegal Guns and Giffords that you don't need to make stuff up. I mean, the, the, the reality is bad enough. Yeah, you know, what I, what I notice about those uh, responses, that tactic, because the first, the first one to do that was uh, the president of, of Brady United, uh, Chris Brown, said uh, basically – and Durbin did the exact same thing, which was said that the allegations of um, that Chipman had made racist remarks were baseless without providing any sort of uh, evidence or even a denial from Chipman himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they'll try to lump that in with some of the stuff that's not true about Chipman, right? Uh, that 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 has has been addressed. Uh, you know, Chipman claims you know says he wasn't at Waco until uh, after the. Uh, you know, the fire and the tragedy that happened there. And, uh, and so, you know, the, they'll, they'll lump these things in and say, oh, there's been things that have been debunked. Um, with, and they're just kind of implying that anything you read about Shimon that's not 100% positive is the same as these, uh, other claims that aren't true. It's a, it's a common tactic, right? When you're, uh, trying to respond to a story that you don't have a good response to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just lump it in with other stories that are uh, that are not credible, uh, and you, by virtue of association, you, you don't even need to respond in any substantive way to the the actual story at hand. Absolutely. Um, all right. So I, I know you you are in the business of reporting, not prognosticating, but uh, I, I will go ahead and ask you. I mean, at this point, what do you think happens with Chipman's nomination? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think at this point, it's going to be very difficult to uh, confirm him because, uh, you know, I, I thought this before this uh, wave of new story, negative stories about him came out uh, because his his confirmation hearing was back in May. Right? Yeah. And the tie vote came like a week after that. Uh, so at any point after that, they could have discharged him to the floor and voted on him, but they haven't because they don't have the votes. I mean, that's the practical nature of it. Uh, and when you look at the nomination of for uh, BLM uh, director, who, which was also extremely controversial, which every Republican opposed um, because uh, her, her history with uh, like eco terrorist organizations, or you know, where there was uh, association there that Republicans said made her unfit for office but Mm -hmm. she was able to get confirmed because she had all 50 votes from democratic senators i think she's the first one to make it on a pure 50 vote uh confirmation but her confirmation hearing happened after chipman and she has already been voted through even though that nomination was also extremely controversial and all the republicans opposed that so Chipman's hearing happened before that, and he still hasn't gotten a vote. And all we've heard in the time since his nominate, since his confirmation hearing, have been negative stories. There hasn't been like positive stories that have come out about him. There haven't been uh, any real. I, I think uh, Maggie Hassan, I guess, uh, said that she would vote for him. So that's probably been his biggest positive development mm-hmm. in that time period, uh, where he got a Democrat to uh, that was sort of on the fence to say yes publicly so uh but it, you know even without the stuff that's happened the last couple of weeks even without my story or the fox story that just came out about the, the china uh interview he was already on the fence so i it's it's going to be a heavy lift they might try to wait it out there's no rush i guess to confirm him there's already an acting director of the atf at right the so maybe they wait for I mean, honestly, it would take some sort of major event, like a very significant mass shooting to try and put pressure on these senators, these Democratic senators to flip their votes or to they haven't they haven't come out and said no yet. But, right. But uh, you, you understand what I mean to, to say yes. I think that's probably what it would take. I don't think like having Zoom calls with the gun control groups is going to do anything because. I mean, you think Angus King isn't aware of what their position is on, on, on Chipman at this point? It's just kind of like uh, childish or naive to think that that's going to 
really do anything. Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know what kind of deal they could make, maybe something in the infrastructure bill, but they probably already have to give a lot to Angus McQueen, or sorry, Angus King and, and, uh, uh, Joe Manchin and, and, uh, John Tester just to get that bill passed in the first place. I don't, you know, what, what leverage do they have over these guys? I don't, I don't know. Right. And that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, you can dank aloud the prospect of, uh, looks like we'll give you, you know, $500 million for a bridge to Presque Isle, uh, uh, Angus. But, uh, again, there's no guarantee that that infrastructure bill, uh, is actually going to get done. Um, yeah, they need yeah. these guys, they need to do something to get them on board just to get that passed in the first place. It's hard to see what they can do to add incentives to also get them to vote on a controversial nominee that they oppose. Um, so yeah. it's hard to see him getting confirmed. Uh, I would also think that if they don't confirm him, maybe they just wait a little while until everything calms down in terms of attention and then they pull his nomination. I think that's kind of what Trump did. Yeah, and and that very well could be. Um, you know, again, I think the next couple of days are critical before they uh, head into the August recess there in the yeah. Senate. And uh, if Chipman does not get a vote, does not get confirmed, the senators uh, head back home. Um, you know, that may be a a quiet uh, end to the Chipman nomination, and then at some point over the recess, you're right, they might just quietly withdraw it. Again, I don't know what Plan B is going to be for uh, for the gun control activists and for the Biden administration, but uh, Plan A. Uh, is uh, not going as they intended right now. Stephen Katowski uh, of the Reload.com. Always good talking to you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the program today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I do appreciate Mr. Gatowski uh, joining us on the program. Uh, and I would just remind you, I mean, this is going to be a fast-moving story over the next couple of days. So uh, be sure to ch- check out uh, BarryAndArms.com for the latest on the chip nomination. We'll probably be able to get the information up on the website faster than we will here uh, on a a podcast and and be sure to follow uh, the reload.com because Stephen is doing some fantastic reporting. Uh, All right, let's turn our attention now to today's armed citizen story. Our uh, good deed of the day, our recidivist report as well. In fact, let's start there with a story not too far from where I'm located in Farmville, Virginia, uh, Martinsville, Virginia, where a former Patrick County basketball player gets two years in prison in the shooting death of a Martinsville man. Yeah, according to the uh, local paper there in Martinsville, the uh, Martinsville Bulletin, uh, this was a drug deal gone bad. And uh, Jermaine Davis, J. Penn Jr. was actually sentenced to 20 years in prison for his role in the killing of Damian Lamont Hairston. But he's only going to have to serve two years of that time. Penn was charged with second-degree murder, shooting a fireman within 1,000 feet of a school, and use of a fireman in the commission of a felony. But he entered an Alford plea back in March to an amended charge of voluntary manslaughter. Uh, an Alford plea means that uh, a defendant maintains his innocence, but admits that the prosecution's evidence would likely result in a guilty verdict if brought to trial. He was sentenced to 10 years, with eight years suspended for manslaughter, and then 10 years, all of which were suspended, for shooting a firearm near a school. The use of a firearm charge was dropped. Penn, who was 19, was one of two former high school players charged with killing Hairston, uh, who was shot outside of a Baptist church on a Sunday night. Uh, 19-year-old Lonnie DeAndre Reynolds, also charged with second-degree murder uh, in the shooting, which took place near uh, Patrick County High School. Reynolds struck a deal on December 18th, and in exchange for pleading guilty to possession of marijuana with intent to distribute distribution of marijuana, providing false information during investigation, and no contest to be an accessory after the fact, the murder charge... Use of a fireman shooting near a school charges were all dropped. Reynolds was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Ten and a half of those years were suspended, and he was ordered to pay court costs. This is, I, I mean, I, again, look, I understand. Maybe the thing is, look, it's, it's, you know, bad guys killing bad guys, drug deal gone bad. How seriously do I want to take this? I don't know. I think he's taking it pretty seriously. It is a violent crime. A man died. And the fact that A plea deal was offered in every one of these cases. It's not like one of these suspects was charged, rolled over, turned state's evidence, and then was able to go after, uh, uh, you know, these other defendants and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. No, they all got plea deals. They all got slaps on the wrist for the murder of Damian Lamont Hairston uh, in January of last year. So, uh, yes. Not quite a true recidivist report because I don't believe that any of these uh, individuals have any previous criminal history. But damn, two years for killing a man? 
And the Democrats in charge of the state legislature in Virginia say the problem right now that we have is that uh, we've just got too many legal gun owners out there. No, I think we've got uh, too many violent crimes without too many without many consequences, quite frankly. In fact, that was the topic of yesterday's entire program. Uh, all right, let's get to today's armed citizen story. This one, a uh, yeah, the headline's right. A bizarre burglary. Avon Lake police arrest man who stole homeowner's gun and returned it to him. This is uh, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And this is a bizarre one. Jim Douglas returned home from a bike ride on Friday, found a guy in his garage getting out of his car. Douglas says, I rolled up and said, what the bleep are you doing here? And he goes, what the bleep are you doing here? And I said, this is my house, a bleep. He said, I look, my door is open. He had my wallet. About 8.30 that morning, police said they got a call about a burglary in progress involving a weapon uh, uh, on a uh, home or in a home. Uh, Dogish told an officer on the scene, he went in that car, he got my wallet, my door's open, that's my t-shirt he's wearing, and he claims he slept here last night. The officer says, well, were you here last night? Dogger said, yeah, I was here last night, I had a friend here until like 11.30. According to uh, Cleveland 19, in an unexpected turn of events, the burglar handed the homeowner his gun and his wallet back. Yeah, Dogger told the officer when the officer arrived on the scene, quote, he goes like this, he goes, oh, I got your gun. He said, I thought the bleeper was going to shoot me. Pulls it out, and he hands it to me, and he says, oh, I've also got your wallet. So Dahlgren then took the firearm, the burglary suspect had taken, and then held the burglary suspect there until officers arrived. Lieutenant Sean Buckelman with the Avon Lake Police says, uh, we did locate the suspect's shirt and wallet at a neighboring front porch. So don't know if the suspect passed out somewhere and woke up and went in the house that morning. Not really sure. Uh, Richard Zegan has now been charged with burglary, as well as two counts of theft. Uh, victim says he believes that Zegan has done this before, just was never caught. He said that uh, Zegan knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he said to a quote, uh, uh, he had the window back here and he pulls it out and he hands it to me. Or he put the gun. He said, I had the gun back here. He pulls it out and he hands it to me. He says, I was bleeping uh, because I thought he was going to bleep and shoot me. I like Mr. Dahlgren, by the way, or uh, Dahlgish. Uh, Dahlgish says he feels lucky to be alive, says the experience has taught him a valuable lesson. Because he accidentally left his garage open. He wants others to be on the lookout and not make the same mistake. That would be good. Also, you know, you might want to think about securing your firearm. Uh, so that if somebody just wanders into your garage, they can't just, you know, grab it out of your car. Just a suggestion. All right. Finally today, our good deed of the day from the Big Apple. A good Samaritan in the right place at the right time. Willing and able to do the right thing. To help a man who had fallen out of his wheelchair and onto subway tracks. Uh, this was Wednesday, and you can see that uh, uh, image there. Uh, the rescue were able to pull the man up just in the nick of time. The, the train actually came around the corner just seconds after this individual uh, was pulled to safety. The uh, man who's not identified, taken to Bellevue Hospital, conscious and alert. Don't know uh, who the Good Samaritan is at this point, but uh, again, we thank him for putting himself at risk to save the life of another. Uh, New York, not necessarily known as the friendliest of towns, but uh, in this case, glad to see a New Yorker step up. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. Uh, don't forget, you can become a VIP subscriber to Bearing Arms. Just go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNS. You'll get 25% off of your VIP membership. You will also get exclusive analysis, commentary, uh, and you'll be helping to support programs like this each and every day. And we really do appreciate your support. Uh, we will be back on Monday with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information. If something huge breaks in the uh, Chipman nomination, we may end up doing a special podcast uh, on Friday. But uh, plan on a Monday return. I hope you have a great rest of your week and a fantastic weekend. Until we talk again, be well, be safe, and be free. <laughs>